from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Hide in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Didi falls, the ride hailing firm losing well, almost $20 billion in market valuation just three days after the company debuted as the largest Chinese listing in US history. The Alibaba's 2014 debut, of course. More on China's listings crackdown. Plus, more on the massive ransomware attack over the weekend targeting the global software supply chain. The White House says US and Russian officials will meet next week. We'll have the latest. And Andy Jassy takes the reins at Amazon. What that means for AWS, regulatory scrutiny, and the overall transparency of the e-commerce giant. Those stories in a moment, but first, US stocks, they fell, snapping a streak of seven consecutive closing record highs to the S&P 500. We saw US Treasury market, really where the action was, yields at the lowest since February, weighing, of course, on the banks and small caps. But Kriti Gupta has the key picture that is big tech back on top again. Absolutely, Caroline. It was a risk-off day in the market, and that is good news for tech. You can see that reversion to that 2020 trade, uh, tech really serving as that safety blanket. That's really what you're seeing here. The S&P 500 dealing with a lot of negative factors here. The Delta variant, the Pfizer vaccine e efficacy, but also, of course, the potential for OPEC plus to not deal with it, come to an agreement, and of course, sending oil prices higher. Those inflationary concerns also weighing on the S&P 500. Once again, that risk off nature really showing up in the NASDAQ. It did not, however, translate into those Chinese textures, which is usually something we see as a bundle trade, and it had everything to do with DD. Of course, you are seeing in the five days since they've IPO'd, a 14% plunge, or I should say an 11% plunge. It was 14% earlier, but you are really seeing this idea that although it was a very attractive IPO for a lot of reasons, this idea that had so much data on a really good chunk of the population, one of the major value adds for this ride-hailing giant, Chinese regulation, this idea that it's Chinese regulatory authorities are coming out and saying, you know what, we have to remove DD from those app stores, really weighing on the stock today, which really brings me to some other big tech companies. Let's just bring it back here stateside because you did also see the Pentagon award a cloud deal split to Amazon and Microsoft. Good news for Amazon, not so great for Microsoft because this was a deal that was solely for Microsoft just a few years ago and now they're having to split it. You can really see Amazon thriving off of that. Microsoft unchanged, was actually negative earlier in the session. So let's just zoom out on the Amazon chart really quickly because I really do want to show you that that spike is actually pretty significant. Mm. You've seen a little bit of sideways move and then that pretty big spike today, Caroline. Yeah, new record high to welcome the new CEO over at Amazon, Kriti Gupta. Great breakdown there on all things of the markets. Meanwhile, let's stick with that news on the Pentagon, having scrapped that $10 billion cloud computing contract that was pretty controversially awarded to Microsoft back in 2019. Now, the Defense Department indicates it plans to divide the work between Microsoft and rival Amazon. Amazon have been arguing that interference from then-President Trump cost its deal. Bloomberg's Naomi Nix joins us with more. So, I mean, is Microsoft going to be really upset by this? Are they wringing their hands? Or, or were they expe expecting this? Well, I think, you know, Microsoft said, look, we're, we're happy to continue working for the government. Obviously, um, they don't get that entire $10 billion pie uh, that they were originally slated for. But the alternative was to extend uh, the contract terms, um, you know, the, the court battle that it was waging to defend this project. Mm. And that could have delayed this process even more. And so, at least in this case, the Pentagon gets to avoid having to fight that lengthy court battle. Microsoft gets to avoid having to delay its work on the contract. And at least it gets a piece of the pie. In, in practice, how do you divide it, Naomi? How will it work with Microsoft and Amazon on the same project? Yeah, I mean, so essentially, part of that's going to be, um, it's going to, they're going to decide based on, on sort of the unique attributes that, that Microsoft uh, brings to the table and the unique attributes that Amazon uh, brings to the table. And so we're, we're, the Pentagon is still figuring out kind of, A, what's that top value number? What's the value of this work going to be? Um, Microsoft and Amazon don't actually automatically get a piece of this new contract. They're going to have to submit proposals, mm. um, which uh, the Pentagon will review. And actually, the Pentagon has said they're going to meet with other companies like Google, like Oracle, 
like IBM to see, you know, if they've evolved in their market services enough that the Pentagon feels that that they should be working with those other companies as well. And just remind us, I mean, back to basics, Naomi, the Jedi contract and implementation, what exactly does it mean for the Pentagon? Yeah, so essentially the Pentagon had decided a, a number of years ago that it really needed to transition uh, to the cloud. Um, and it, the idea was that it would have sort of this big data repository and it would choose just one company, give it, 10 up to 10 billion dollars over a decade and you know a lot of the tech companies fought hard against that initially in the industry it was seen that amazon was the front runner for the deal because it had gotten a similar deal from the cia and you saw companies like oracle and microsoft and ibm team up to lobby against the contract um then he, then microsoft you know uh, unexpectedly got the deal and amazon filed a lawsuit saying that you know, interference by uh, Donald Trump cost them the deal. So this has been really a long road for the <laughs> Pentagon to implement technology it has considered critical, um, you know, for our war fighters. Wow. And it still continues. Hopefully they'll continue and, uh, and get some up to speed by early 2022. Naomi Nix, we thank you for the breakdown there. Meanwhile, we're just hearing from Kriti. The other key top story today in tech was China issuing a sweeping warning to its biggest companies, vowing to tighten oversight of data security and well, of overseas listings. Of course, this comes days after DD lifted itself in the United States. That was a pretty oh, interesting decision on their part as well. Bloomberg's Crystal C with us. The reason I say it's sort of interesting is that what we learned through our Bloomberg reporting, through your reporting, is that Didi seems to have known, even have been told perhaps, by the government in China to postpone the IPO, but it went ahead anyway. That seems to be correct. So they were told to delay it. We, we don't know if that's because they know that the probe's going to come or whether they know that they were going to get taken off the App Store. We don't know what DD knew that at that point, but we had learned that they were told that that perhaps may not be the best time to do a deal. That ha last week happened to be also the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. So there are very many factors why last week was an interesting timing for such a big debut. But having your app taken down the App Store four days after you go public mm. is definitely not great optics. There are a lot of questions about what they know at the time, what they communicated to investors during the roadshow, whether, in, uh, whether investors or bankers know about this. So we're continuing to follow the story. But this is definitely weighing in on a lot of um, definitely having an effect on a lot of ADRs especially because this is not the first time such a high-profile deal um, see crackdown right after they gone, they gone public or plan to go public. And financial, as you remember, have seen similar mm -hmm. things. Byte Dance has seen similar things. So um, it's, it's an interesting time for China tech. It's a very interesting time for the Chinese government as well. What do you think in terms of the pipeline of companies that you have to cover when they come to America to list? How many of them will be Chinese in the future? How many will be put off by what the sagas are that Alibaba's had to go through and now Didi? Yeah, we have actually seen the Chinese ADR pipeline shrinking over the years. Back in 2017, 2018, those really were the prime time. We have seen, you know, even the majority of the deals back in the days were from China. For these days, majority of the international listings we see are from Israel. There are a lot of um, enterprise software companies. The biggest international news this year is actually from Korea. So Chinese ADR is increasingly it's increasingly less influential in the in the ECM market in the U.S. That said, there's some interest still because. A lot of the U.S. investors, especially venture investors, P investors, have privately invested in a lot of these big Chinese tech companies mm. like the Ant, the DD, the ByteDance, and they still want the very liquid um, exit, such as a U.S. IPO. So that dynamic is going to continue to play. And, you know, whether regulatory risk is bigger than a liquid uh, exit, that is really down to the backers to decide. We'll have to see whether more go through the Hong Kong Shanghai route rather than the United States. But Crystal C all over that story for us. We thank you as always. Meanwhile, coming up, well, the flood of news of the weekend just didn't stop. Cyber attacks continuing. Hundreds of businesses affected over the weekend by what's believed to be a Russia-linked group. We have the details next. This is Bloomberg.
latest cyber attack apparently stemming from Russia again and has hit at least 20 software firms affecting at least 1,000 businesses. Now, it follows a cyber attack that left parts of the United States without adequate gasoline supplies for several days and, of course, one on the Irish public health system as well. There are undoubtedly many more attacks that go unreported, if only because the victims do not wish to advertise their willingness to pay ransom. But the question remains, will ransomware attacks end and, if so, when? Let's bring in Wendy Whitmore of Palo Alto Networks to discuss. Of course, you deal with dozens of ransomware cases involving this particular reveal. Talk to us about who we understand potentially to be behind what happened over the course of the weekend, Wendy. Yes, yeah, so it has been a busy weekend, Caroline. Uh, you know, in short, this attack group uh, has been responsible for what we call a model of ransomware as a service or the affiliate model. And so while this attack group might be new to your viewers, we've actually been investigating them since 2018. Uh, this group in particular is responsible for a lot of these more sophisticated business processes that we see from attackers. And uh, ultimately, what we're talking about as this concept of ransomware as a service, mm -hmm. that strategy was used in this case. Uh, in particular, what that means is this group called Revil has rented out their communications infrastructure, their developers, their leak site, which is known as the happy blog, in order for another group who's actually responsible for conducting the attack. Huh. In return, Revil gets a percentage of their proceeds. Sort of hire a ransomware hitman to a certain degree. How does this feed into what we're now learning in terms of, well, the RNC as well, the Republican National Party being hacked as well? I mean, that seems to be Russian government-related attackers, but perhaps not Revil. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I think one of the things that's really important here to realize is that in, we've got a ransomware problem throughout the world. And ultimately, regardless of where the attacks are coming from, uh, we cannot allow governments to enable attackers to operate without or with impunity in their environments. So it's going to really require a coordinated effort where we share threat intelligence, where we are making sure that we are disrupting attacker infrastructure and that governments are working together so that we can have more organizations who actively choose not to pay the ransom. That mm. is critical. That's critical. What's so interesting about the timing of all of this is that President Biden only just met with Putin. They've only just been discussing the fact that they wanted to see a step back from Russian cybersecurity threat. Is it always going back to Russia? As you say, that Revil, perhaps Russia-based, but could have been anyone who's hiring them. What do we know in terms of the timing and the sensitivity of the relationship between Russia and the United States? Uh, well, certainly, uh, you know, that's a very sensitive issue. Diplomacy between our two countries uh, is always something that I think we'll be working towards. I think this attack in particular is not necessarily new, hmm. but what is new and interesting about this attack is the financial model that they're moving towards. And quite frankly, we're curious as to whether that's something we're going to continue to see. So in this case, we've seen uh, the attack demand be $70 million. And to put that in a historical context, five years ago, the average ransom demand we saw was 10,000 US dollars. 70 million is huge. And what they've done unique here is that they, uh, they certainly now have decreased that ask to 50 million, but that is for a universal decryptor, which would be similar to like the master key at a hotel. And they've also then monetized individual systems. So for example, for 45,000 US dollars, you could decrypt an individual system, which mm. would be like getting the key to your specific hotel room. Uh, attackers are gonna continue to become more creative about ways they can command more money on these attacks. And particularly, how much are they looking at getting into certain sort of entire food chains? The fact that they hit one particular software provider that, of course, has the ripple effect of affecting thousands of, of other small businesses. Is that something that they're looking to do or is that just a, a happy byproduct from their perspective? They are absolutely looking to disrupt supply chains, and that relates to their ability to command more money. I think one of the areas which we're cautiously optimistic about in this case in particular is that the Kaseya CEO has come out 
provided specific actions that the company has already taken. They have clearly communicated those, and they've really focused on the effectiveness of their incident response plan and having playbooks. That's something that we would encourage clients and organizations throughout the world to focus on preparedness. That is a key to stopping these types of attacks moving forward. Super smart. Wendy Whitman, we thank you of Palo Alto Networks. Meanwhile, coming up, neighborhood social media app. That's next door is the latest tech company to go public via a SPAC, that special purpose acquisition company. We'll hear from next door CEO Sarah Fryer alongside Kozler Ventures founder Vinod Kozler. That's next. And of course, as we head to a commercial break, take a look at this chart. US traded shares of China's Twitter like service. It's Weibo ending Tuesday, actually up almost 7% after jumping close to 40% at the start of the day. The move came after a Reuters report that said Weibo and a state investor were in talks to take the company private. Weibo later issued a statement denying that report. Still higher, though. This is Bloomberg. Next door is the latest company to go public via a SPAC. The neighborhood social media app will merge with the blank check company created by the venture capital firm of billionaire Vinod Kozler. Now, the deal is expected to value next door at $4.3 billion. Bloomberg Ed Hammond spoke with Vinod Kozler and next door CEO Sarah Fry. Next door is already one in three households in the United States, 276,000 neighborhoods across 11 countries, but we are primed and ready for growth. So what these proceeds do are, number one, they let us continue to grow new neighbors onto the platform. We're a network effect business. More neighbors means more content. It allows us to keep adding personalization. So when you come as a neighbor, it feels like home. It's a place where you wanna meet the people around you. And then we wanna keep investing for businesses, both the small local businesses who thrive in local communities, but also our proprietary ad tech stack. Beyond that, of course, it's about going, going global as well. We know Nextdoor works in every country around the world and we just need to get it there. Vinod, you've talked about the appeal of working uh, with Sarah again, and obviously you guys have a pre-existing relationship going back to Square. And indeed, Square grew phenomenally. I think you talked about this morning being a $2 billion market cap company that went to 100. This deal values next to a roughly foreign change. How do you see this growing? I mean, could this be another $100 billion company or potentially even bigger? Without picking numbers, Nextdoor is the neighborhood social network, just like LinkedIn is a network for professionals. It really has strong network effects and an unusual feature, which is online and offline effects, which you seldom see in online networks. So in terms of potential, we see a lot of potential. In fact, most of the growth is ahead of us. There's huge growth factor in, of course, the local digital advertising, international growth, but there's also non-advertising sources of revenue that are possible in the future that excite us. So how big can it be? It depends on how well the team executes, but it's not limited by the opportunity. And we think we have a great team here. Sarah, a big part of the ethos of this company, and you've talked a lot about it, is kindness and this, this aim to be the sort of kind networking platform. Indeed, I think this company is going to trade on the kind post-completion of this, this deal. I wonder how you manage that when you have this trend where social networking, social media have become, as it were, the repository of choice for a lot of venom, a lot of rabble-rousing. How do you maintain that message on your platform without editorializing and, and potentially censoring your users? Yeah, I mean, this is at the core of who we are, right? Nextdoor was founded on trust. You had to be confirmed as a real neighbor at a real address. There's no avatars or bots. And so we think part of it is social science, right? Behavioral science. When people are their real selves and you might actually bump into them in the line at the local coffee shop, you inherently act better. That said, we don't want it to be all kind of saccharine and sweet, right? Kind can sometimes get you into that zone. We want kind to read as bold, to bring tough conversations to the fore and have people disagree but not be disagreeable. And that comes back to we can use technology again in tandem with behavioral science. So we do things like kindness reminder, right? If we see you posting something with some of that venom that you just talked about, 
we actually slow you down and remind you that what you're about to post is likely to be reported, for example, that actually tends to make people be their better selves. And they also think from here, not from here where their biases reside. So we've done a lot of work to wrap technology into this. So it's not about moderation and editorializing, rather it's about how do we utilize technology to help people engage, but in much more constructive ways. Even though sometimes it means that it tips down engagement, we don't wanna just fuel the engagement fire for growth at any cost. We believe great growth comes because you build a platform that people feel welcomed onto. Uh, Vinod, the spec boom obviously is something we're seeing slow down. We've seen that reflected in the way a lot of these vehicles are now trading. Do you think this particular market bubble has, has run its course? Well, there were good things about SPACs and bad things about SPACs. Um, you know, biotech has always been able to do IPOs without having revenue for five, 10 years. The ability to explain your future when it's different than your past, which we see in the case of Nextdoor, accelerating growth, uh, is a real benefit to companies when they're considering an IPO versus a SPAC alternative, in my view. And if we can eliminate the abuses in the SPAC market, for example, no warrants, longer lockups, more regulation. So investors, uh, companies are held to the same standard as if they were doing an IPO. I think it's a very good, important tool, but the slowdown is healthy and will result in better SPACs and better SPAC behavior. Coastal Ventures founder Vinod Kozla there with Nextdoor CEO Sarah Fryer speaking with our own Ed Hammond. Now, the innovators in the world of decentralized finance. Well, apparently, they've built synthetic versions of equities that track some of the world's biggest companies, fake versions of Tesla, Apple, Amazon, other big stocks that have been created by the project Mirror Protocol and that of synthetics as well. They're now trading on blockchains and the tokens reflect the prices of the securities they track without actually any actual purchases or sales of the real stocks. Another way to play the stock market. Meanwhile, coming up, we hear from the Binance US CEO, Brian Brooks, on the regulatory scrutiny it's facing and crypto's wild ride this year. Meanwhile, crypto staying pretty unvolatile, still at about $33,000 for Bitcoin. From New York, there's Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in for Emily Chang. Let's get back to the markets and bring in Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta for a look at well, how the market shaped up the day. Well, Caroline, a risk-off day. And of course, on risk-off days, who are the winners? It's tech and it's treasuries. You can really see that out here with the Nasdaq 100's outperformance. This is going to be really crucial as we talk about where we go next. Now, let's just talk about the fact that as we start to see risk sentiment drip, uh, dip, I should say, Bitcoin does too. So if you just look at a two-day chart, for example, you are starting to see that very big sentiment indicator dropping, dropping. No one wants to invest in those speculative assets anymore, and that's really seeping in to the broader market. So where do you go from here? Well, Caroline, the 50-day moving average might just be kind of the roadmap some traders are looking for, because take a look at this longer-term chart. The Bitcoin is currently trading right now back to where it was, close to where it was, I should say, at the start of the year. But that's when you started to see the 50-day moving average really provide kind of this line of support mm. for the cryptocurrency. But now, it's resistance, Caroline. Let's see if that holds something to watch for in the days to come. Some live editing going on the Bloom, beautiful Bloomberg terminal as well. Kriti Gupta, we thank you. All things crypto. Let's stick with it. A regulatory crackdown around cryptocurrencies. It's been escalating amid concerns about its potential involvement in money laundering and fraud, of course. Now, we spoke with the Binance US CEO, Brian Brooks, earlier. Take a listen. The premise seems to be that regulation is bad for crypto or it's scary for crypto. Truth is, we're in a transition point where the number of people participating in this market has gotten so big that you need basic frameworks. And that's actually a sign of the maturity and the growth of the market more than it is a sign of something bad. What I think it does mean, though, is that exchanges like ours, you know, the biggest exchanges in the world, need to be very sophisticated about how do you allow decentralization to occur? How do you bring these assets to the market while ensuring good risk management, compliance with law, the disclosure of what you're selling to your customers and those kinds of things. And that's why we're so excited 
about bringing the former California Financial Institutions Commissioner Manny Alvarez on board. We need people with those kinds of backgrounds who have been policymakers in senior roles to help us navigate these shoals. And I think the successful companies are going to see that and try to compete for that kind of talent. Brian, can you sort of clarify the relationship for viewers between Binance US and Binance globally, which is the world's uh, biggest <laughs> crypto exchange by far? I know that this sort of uh, it's a um, there's they're separate legal entities, but can you explain like how are you owned by them or what is the what is the relationship? Yeah, so we're not owned by them at all. Binance.com doesn't own a single share of, of Binance US. We share a common founder. And uh, historically, Binance US licensed the name and some technology from Binance.com. The way to think about it really is that a couple of years ago, it was clear that the world was segmenting into two basic kinds of markets. You had most of the world, which was still learning about crypto, didn't have crypto uh, you know, licenses or requirements. And then you had an emerging part of the developed world that started putting crypto within a regulatory framework. We were founded precisely to be a regulatorily compliant licensed exchange. So we've got 43 uh, US states that allow us to trade in their borders based on licenses and other, other uh, legal compliance mechanisms that we have. We'll eventually have all 50 state licenses. And then of course, there are other parts of the world served by a different company. But other than licensing the name and licensing the technology, mm -hmm. we operate independently. We have a separate board of directors. We have a separate ownership. And uh, you know, you might think about us as essentially a Binance branded exchange that's doing our own business here. They're the biggest in the world. We're the yeah. eighth biggest in the world. Different companies. All right. So we got the brand here in the U.S. Uh, now, Brian. I, I, when we talk about the U.S. regulation or lack of it, and I, I'm curious as to your thoughts as to why it's moved, been so slow uh, to see something a little bit more formative out mm -hmm. of uh, the SEC and the other regulators here, uh, whether it's setting up guardrails, whether it's approving ETFs. They, there just doesn't seem to be uh, any real momentum, at least not uh, I can see publicly. But well, Romain, that is a great comment. And I think, honestly, it says more about the U.S. regulatory system than it says about crypto, to be honest. Part of it is, you know, in this country, we set up a lot of different regulators and gave them each their share of turf. So the issue is, and I know this having having run one of these agencies, there's a little bit of inherent turf conflict between, you know, the Fed and the OCC or the SEC and the CFTC. Everybody's trying to grab a little bit of turf. And because of that, it's hard to get clarity. If you look at a country like the United Kingdom, where there's basically a single regulator for the entire financial system, that's the Financial Conduct Authority, it's a lot easier to get clarity. Over here, you've got competition among agencies, there's overlap in their jurisdiction, and so at some level, it's tough to deal with. But I will say, we're not as far behind as people might think. I mean, at the end of the last administration, all of the major regulators, myself included, got together through the president's working group on financial markets and started providing some clarity on certain crypto assets like stable coins. And I think that's an example of how our regulatory system can adapt if all the regulators work together. Binance US CEO there, Brian Brooks, earlier today. Meanwhile, let's talk about the solar industry that has spent decades slashing the cost of generating electricity directly from the sun. Now it's focusing on well, making panels even more powerful, thinner, more transparent. Bloomberg's He Su Lee reports from South Korea. Today, we are at Korea Electric Power Corp's Research Institute in Daejeon for a peek at Perovskite, one of many innovations companies are working to take solar power to the next level. Perhaps the biggest success story for energy and the environment in the past decade is how companies managed to cut the cost of solar panels by 90 percent, making them an even cheaper source of electricity than coal in many parts of the world. Now that they have made them cheap, companies are working to make them more powerful. The reason for that is that panels are just part of the cost of solar power. Developers also have to lease land, compensate workers, and pay big loans. As panels become a smaller part of the overall cost, it helps developers if they're more powerful to get more return on the rest of their spending. TEPCO is one of several firms researching a material known as perovskite. It's thin and transparent and converts sunlight into electricity. The hope is that it will be layered over solar panels to give them an extra jolt of power and someday maybe even tapped to the sides of buildings to generate clean energy in land star places like Hong Kong and Singapore. Perfskite isn't commercially viable yet. It's just one of several things companies are doing to supercharge solar. Other innovations include having panels soak up light reflected off the ground, increasing the size of wafers that make up the panels, 
and using more costly but more powerful cell designs. Lynn Rose, he's your lead for that report. We thank her. Meanwhile, women make the first move dating app Bumble. Well, open its first cafe right here in New York City this month. Bumble Brew will be a restaurant and wine bar for, you guessed it, of course, daters, as well as apparently networkers and friends. It will be located in Manhattan's Nolita neighborhood downtown. Since listing back in February, shares have risen 28%. Meanwhile, coming up, investors seem to like Amazon's new CEO, Andy Jassy, shares rising on his first day at the helm. Of course, there's a slight news on the Pentagon win. We're going to be taking a check with VC legend Matt McEwen of Madrona Venture Group, who took a chance on the e-commerce site back in 1995 when it was just a glimmer of Jeff Bezos' eye. Our work shifting series is next. This is Bloomberg. <music> Nintendo, well, it's unveiled its long-awaited upgrade to the Switch. The device comes with a 7-inch OLED OLED screen, enhanced audio, and a $350 price tag. Now, it's the first hardware upgrade to the console since 2017, and the new Switch goes on sale. Get this October 8th. It's expected to spare a wave of new software just in time for the holiday season. See how GameStop performs on that. Meanwhile, Amazon shares rise. That's on the first day of Andy Jassy's new role as CEO. Now, as for what Amazon will look like under Jassy, his prior unit, AWS, stands to gain more resources. The company focuses more on the cloud. This, as Microsoft appears to be nipping at Amazon's heels in the cloud infrastructure and software department. With more on how Jassy might position the company upon founder Jeff Bezos' departure, let's bring in Matt McElwain, of course, of Madrona Venture Group. In 1995, Matt, you took a chance on a then little known company called Amazon. Kudos to you, my friend. What an amazing investment. Matt, you're with our work shifting conversation right now. And clearly, some good news helping the stock on the back of today. There's the news around the Pentagon as well. But if you're Andy Jassy, and I'm sure you know him well, and he's a man who got on board the, when the company went public, what are his key focus points right now? Well, I think he's already accomplished one of the most important ones, which is bringing back two really important people to the team and Adam Slipsky to run AWS. Adam was his right-hand person in that organization for its first 10 years. And then Jeff Blackburn, who of course, built a whole bunch of the digital businesses as well as ran corporate development. So for Andy to be able to move into this role, this new role of CEO, to have two trusted partners that have come back into the organization really gives him leverage. How much is a trusted person, Andy Jassy, at the moment, particularly as we go into new regulatory conversations? He's the new face. How, how well is he known already by that sort of community, do you think? Well, I think that is exactly the right word, Caroline. I think trust and transparency are the two things that Andy is going to need to focus on both internally and externally. And it's really interesting to look at these two new uh, corporate principles that were put out just last week. And you see the words empathy in the one that's employee focused, and you see the word humble in the one that's externally focused. Mm. I think those are very intentional choices of words. And Andy is a person that I think people find is easy to trust. He's got a set of attributes that combines kind of a real genuine authenticity with very high expectations. But now he's going to have to extend that into a much broader set of areas. You know, in addition to the one that he built, which is AWS, you know, kind of led and built, but into all these other parts of the business. And as to your point, a lot of external audiences as well. What other sort of cylinders can he fire up? AWS, of course, has been powering part of the growth story mm -hmm. for Amazon. But now, you know, they're ever expanding the area of e-commerce, looking at fashion, looking at other parts. Where, where do you think AWS, well, where do you think Amazon really goes? Because they've not always fired straight and true. I mean, they went into hard, hardware and that didn't always pay the dividends they wanted. Well, the interesting thing there is that they've had, you know, successes in hardware like Kindle and, mm. and then things like the Fire Phone that didn't work at all. But rather than stopping there, they continued on and invented the Echo and the whole Alexa ecosystem. Mm. So I think they're very comfortable with pioneering and innovating and trying new things and then trying to learn from the things that don't work rather than give up. Here's a good example. 
health care. I think that is an area of massive opportunity for Amazon. You saw just today that they announced an at-home you know, $40 kit for doing COVID testing. And that's just one of many examples, but it wasn't but a couple of years ago when they had this unsuccessful venture, this haven venture that they were trying to do with yeah, Warren yeah. Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway as, along with JP Morgan. And yet I think that in the healthcare area, whether it's in things like this testing service that they just launched, or their own prescription drug offering that they acquired in PillPack, or some of the other things that they're working on with direct care to, uh, to employees and now people even outside of the employee base of Amazon, there is a lot of opportunity to reinvent in the area of, of, of healthcare. And I think that's one of the high ones on the list. Will you want to see them do M&A to scale in those sorts of areas, or is it always about organic growth when it comes to Amazon? You know, I think it is, it's usually a combination. I, I do think Andy has historically been pretty frugal. I think the company has been overall, but I think that he's been comparatively frugal in around acquisitions within AWS. You know, you, you can't really think of any major examples of acquisitions within AWS. It'll be interesting to see how that translates. Mm. I think they try to keep an open mind. And there have been times, you know, you know, Whole Foods, they, they spent almost $15 billion for, yeah. or Pillpack was a very young company that they spent a billion dollars on in investing in buying that company. So I think they'll keep an open mind on acquisitions. The interesting thing when we come back to AWS, as you asked before, is what are they going to do at the application level? When you think of AWS in terms of the, the, the things that they have built themselves, it's been mostly at the infrastructure and kind of enabling technologies level. You, you know, they don't really have a lot of big successes. There's a few smallish examples within the application layer. And that's where a Microsoft, a Google, mm -hmm. even a Salesforce, you know, are both competitors and in some ways collaborators. And then you ask the question, well, is that going to be an area where they partner in interesting ways with companies out there that, that complement them, like a smart sheet and, uh, and a sales force, which they just announced a deeper partnership with, or do they ultimately have to go buy some companies to really build up their application stack within AWS? And then of course, we know that any acquisition they do make is going to be under heavy re regulatory scrutiny as well, as they currently are with MGM. I'm, I'm interested, Matt, to sort of finish it off, your, your knowledge of the characters involved and your knowledge of the culture that has been brought to Amazon, how does that continue to iterate, do you think? Well, there's always been a focus on the customer first. And people say that, and in Amazon, they live it. And so that is going to stay. It's going to be strengthened under you know, Andy's leadership. I do think going back to these words like empathy and humble, I might add authenticity, and the, 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 the output of that, of earning trust, how does that manifest itself in a deeper way with employees, with these external parties, whether it's the government or the media or others, and equally importantly, with just other partners? I have this kind of concept of how do you build a sustainable ecosystem? Amazon's less a platform company like Microsoft than it's a sustainable ecosystem company. And I think some folks would say, hey, they haven't done it very sustainably. In other words, they've sort of taken too much from the ecosystem versus building out an ecosystem that can have a flywheel mm. effect that is continuously sustainable and kind of a win-win-win. That's going to be the operational challenge that Andy and his teams face. Matt McElwain, great insights there. We thank you so much, Modrano Venture Group, man who is in on the Amazon uh, investment train very early on. Meanwhile, coming up, school may be out for the summer, but ed tech company Paper is looking to make the tutoring process even more accessible to students. We speak with CEO Phil Cutler next. And the Apple edge closer to a record high as it gained for a sixth straight session. JP Morgan analyst saying it's time to start buying again and anticipate significant outperformance over the next two to three months. Apple hit a record high, $143.16 in January. Getting closer on it. This is Bloomberg. We've gotten a positive reaction so far. Um, so we're hoping that it'll be another eight months, could be longer than that, but things are going well. 
AT&T team's working hard, our team is working hard, so very exciting bringing these two companies together. We have a strategy that we've developed and now we'll see how HBO Max does and HBO over the next year, how we do with Discovery Plus, uh, and we'll see if we can come up with something, some best practice. How nice of him to match his Ray-Bans with the colour of Bloomberg technology. Meanwhile, Discovery CEO David Suslov that was speaking at the Allen & Co Sun Valley Conference, giving some insight into the timeline of the company's pending merger with Warner Media. Make sure you stay with Bloomberg for continued coverage of the wheeling and dealing that goes on in Sun Valley. Our Ed Ludlow is all over it. Meanwhile, let's talk seriously about education now. With many children learning remotely this past school year, extra help for those struggling with change well, it's been a huge demand. Ed tech company, Paper, provides 24-7 chat tutoring to help every student reach their potential at no cost to the students. Joining us now, CEO Phil Cutler, who's been raising money for the company, been out while well, looking to wheel and deal with, interestingly, the actual school districts, right? Talk to us about how your business model is different from some of the rest. You're more B2B than you are B2C, right? Yeah, absolutely. Caroline, thank you for, for having me on here today. For sure, our approach to, to tutoring is very different than a lot of the other companies that exist out there. We go directly to the school districts, partner with them, and that allows every student within their schools to get access to academic support. Traditionally, a lot of that support has been reserved for wealthier families. With us, we partner with the school district to allow every student that access. Where are you finding demand coming from at the moment? You're, in, you're based in Montreal right now. Prevalence in, in North America, largely? Yeah, our, our customers are, are almost all exclusively in the U.S. We have a strong presence on the coast, California, um, definitely the, the largest for us right now. We work with just over 100 school districts coast to coast. It's interesting that it's California school districts. Do you think that there's an, you know, we all associate technology with California. Is there an element that you see certain school districts more willing to embrace the move towards technology or is actually everyone now post-COVID? So I would have had a different answer for you a couple of years ago, but right now we're definitely seeing everybody really open to it. The last year has been really transformational for our education system, broadly speaking, and the academic support piece has really been highlighted just by the fact that students have been remote, back in school. There's so much change. It really identified the fact that there are a lot of students who just didn't have that support. So in the past, yeah, California, I mean, technology, obviously, California, there's a lot of like, synonymousness there. But with us, I think we're seeing paper be something that's applicable to districts everywhere in the country now. It's been just, uh, it's been crazy to watch this over the last year. But Phil, how does post-COVID help or hinder, to a certain extent, I feel like, some people never want to have their children on a Zoom again. It was just all too much, too fast, too thick. How much will we get a balance of still technology within the education process? Uh, I think the devices that have been purchased by districts, and when you look at what was happening pre-COVID to, to today, pre-COVID, 60% of school districts were one-to-one -one devices. So that meant a computer, a laptop, um, you know, iPad, whatever it may be for every student. By the time students returned to school in August, September last year, that number had risen to 95%. Mm -hmm. So billions of dollars were invested in hardware. The schools aren't going to be asking students to hand in their laptops for textbooks. So I feel very strongly this is just the beginning of a trend. We're really starting to see this evolution happen, and it's happening quite rapidly. And rapid growth in companies, all in ed tech. I mean, Paper, of course, yourself, Quizlet, Chegg, Course Hero, Brainly, all of them with slightly different business models. I'm interested, Phil, in, in what you think makes yours different from another company that might come along and want to, well, serve the school districts too. Yeah, look, I mean, the space definitely is having a moment right now. We've seen in the last week uh, Duolingo instructor filing their S1s. So there's a lot of movement, especially within the, some of these businesses that have been venture backed and you know, may not have necessarily had the exit velocity that you would have typically seen in other areas. We're seeing that now in education, which is exciting. In our particular model, by partnering with the school districts, it really is an equity play for them and you know, for everybody within the community. A lot of the businesses you mentioned, they're focusing either going directly to the consumers, which has typically been the popular model for tutoring in the past, or they're partnering with teachers or schools at like an individual level, not necessarily the school district. So we focus more on partnering at the district level and making sure every student within that community is supported by the tutoring that we provide. And this is something, again, it comes back to that notion of equity. 
Very quick on 30 seconds left. One way you're going, one thing you're going to announce, one thing you're going to develop, one thing you're going to scale. <laughs> There's a lot we have to be focusing on right now i think for us one of the really exciting things that we launched today is something called camp paper so this is a summer offering for students to be able to actually participate in enriching summer experiences it's all virtual but for a lot of our customers the school districts just don't have a ton of resources available to their communities during the summer this is giving students the ability to learn something to stimulate their mind during the summer months and this is, again, it's free of charge to all those families. So it's, it's again, an investment by the district mm -hmm. into their communities. So we're excited about that. Thank you for sharing. Paper CEO Phil Cutler, stay well. Thank you. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you tune in tomorrow when we'll be joined by the Blockchain Capital General Partner, Spencer Bogart, and Phil Libin, co-founder and CEO of online video platform. Mm -hmm. I'm Caroline Hyde. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.